Well, glory to God. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be in church. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Well, happy new year to everyone. I hope you had a wonderful time as we did. Our family and I got out of town for a little bit and uh, we just, just, just had a good time refreshing and enjoying each other's company. It was a blast with the kiddos. Praise God. Well, here we are, 2022. Praise God. Aren't you excited what the Lord has for you in your life this year? Hallelujah. Well, you should be. You should be very excited. Amen. In fact, uh, you know, a, a good way to check your level of faith on anything is to see how excited you are about it. Woo. Woo. If you're not very excited about something, then you're probably not allowing your faith to operate on the level that will carry you to victory in that area. Okay. And, you know, a lot of people don't think about that, but a lot of reason why people aren't excited about their life or excited about what, the, about what the Lord has or anything like that is because they're trying to fight their own battle. If you try to fight your own battle, it can be hard, it can be really difficult, it can be really challenging. You think that you have to do it on your own. But the battle is the Lord's, and the victory is yours. You know, the Lord had me talk about this first service. David went out to his brothers on the battlefield to bring them some food, some vital things that they needed to remain out there on the battlefield, right? They're out there on this battlefield. David comes to make the delivery. He sees and hears Goliath defying Israel and their God. None of his brothers that we read were very excited about Goliath. None of the Israeli army was very excited about Goliath standing in their face. But David got excited. You say, what do you mean he got excited? Oh, he got excited. Well, how do you know that, Pastor? Because David began to ask around, what does the guy get that kills this Goliath? You with me this morning? What does the guy get that takes him down? That's excitement. You know why? Because he was seeing himself slaying that giant. And he wanted to know what is the reward for killing that giant? What is the reward for that? That's faith. And that's excited about operating in faith. Then, what does David say? <laughs> he says, and you can look it up for yourself if you want to throw it on the screen, 1 Samuel 17, 47. He said, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. See, he knew who the battle was. The battle is, come on now, the battle is, <laughs> and the battle's still the Lord's. Amen? And you can get excited about the victory as David was, because the battle is, and the victory is ours. Woo! All right. All right, I've already, I'm already happy. I was happy before I came out first service. I preached myself even happier in first service. And so I'm even happy, happy, happier second service. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, the name that's above every other name. Lord, thank you for the relationship that we have with you. Thank you that we can fellowship with you, talk with you, commune with you, that you hear our prayers, that you speak to our hearts and to our lives, that you minister to each and every one of us individually, and at the same time, you minister to us corporately as a body. Thank you, Lord, that we are people that are not lost, 
but we're people that have a king. And you happen to be the king of kings <laughs> and the Lord of lords. We have oversight. We have help. We can draw upon your help, your wisdom, in all that we do. And Lord, right now, as we have entered into this new year of 2022, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that healing is ours, that strength is ours, and I bind every foul spirit of wickedness and perversion that would try to come against us in the name of Jesus. I rebuke every sickness and disease from our body in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Lord, that by the stripes of Jesus, we are healed. And Lord, I thank that you are giving to us clarity, wisdom, insight, and spiritual understanding for what we need for this new year and the years to follow. Thank you for your protection over this body of believers, over our families, our family members, in all that we do. And Lord, I thank you that no weapon formed against us will prosper. And every tongue that rises against us will be condemned and proven in the wrong. Thank you, Lord, for being our King, for being our Lord, for being our Savior. And Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus in the name of Jesus over this body of believers, over this church, over every partner and every member of this ministry. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you help me. And as you pour into me, I pour out. And Lord, I thank you for the leadership of this ministry. I thank you for every man and woman that serves in capacity of leadership for this church. And Lord, I thank you for your wisdom and to do so. I thank you, Lord, for your insight to do so. I thank you for your strength to do so. That we lead, that we do things that we never thought we could ever do. Things that are uncommon, Lord. And I pray for every person that walks in the doors of this church to absolutely be changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that those who walk in these doors that have, that have dealt with alcoholism and addiction, in Jesus' name, it will be gone and drop off of them like a dirty, filthy rag, gone from them in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that your anointing removes every burden and destroys every yoke that the enemy has tried to entangle people with in Jesus' name. And Lord, people will know, people will see, it'll be evidence that the power of the Spirit of God is in this place and on this body of believers. And Lord, you are drawing all to yourself in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, Lord, I pray that you go out and minister and bring people and draw them in in Jesus' name to be a part of what you would have for us to do. And I, Lord, I thank you that there is an intense focus this year, a, a, a focus, Lord, on what it is that you've called us to do, and we'll do it in a greater measure than we've ever done in 20 years. Thank you, Father that we'll lead more people to Jesus. We'll see more people baptized in the Spirit. We'll see more people baptized in water. We'll see more people serving Jesus this year than we've seen all combined in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, that families are being reunited. Things are changing. Things are being rearranged, rearranged in people's lives. And we give you the glory and we give you the praise. Oh, Lord, yes, yes, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We pray for all those who are in the leadership, Lord. We pray for all those who are in authority. We pray for godly wisdom to fill their heart and mind that they would act on that and make decisions based on what is right and righteous and true and honest and pure. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, I thank you for your anointing of leadership on me in Jesus' name. Because I realize and recognize that by myself I cannot do this. But I also recognize that I'm not by myself. You've called me and you've anointed me. 
So I trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. All right. Hallelujah. Give him praise. Give the Lord praise. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, we're starting a new series this morning. Oh, my word. What in the world? We're starting a new teaching series this morning. Are you excited? See, some of you are waiting for the title to get excited. You don't have to wait for the title to get excited. Just get excited. Now, we, we taught over 20 services, 20 messages on understanding the power of God. And like I said when we started it, there's no way we'll exhaust the knowledge and understanding of the power of God, okay? But today, we're starting a new series entitled The Way, The Truth, and The Life. The way, the truth, and the life. Woo! Amen? Say it with me. The way, the truth, and the life. All right? I like to do a little subtitle to my messages. And that today is this. Compromise is the counterfeit of truth. Compromise is the counterfeit of of truth. All right? Okay. Turn in your Bible with me to John chapter 14, verse 1, please. Praise the Lord. All right. John 14, 1. Let's launch off, get started here. I got a long way to go and a short time to get there. All right? He says, let not your heart be troubled. Is that for you? Yeah, that's you. Okay. He says, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither, and, and, and whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? All right. In verse 2 and in verse 3, he says, I go to prepare a place. Verse 3 says, and if I go and prepare a place, there is a place. All right. There is a place. Now you might think, well, yeah, everybody knows that. No, not everybody does know that. I've learned in 20 years of ministry, don't assume what you think everybody knows that comes to church, okay? There is a place. He has gone to prepare a place. I've had Christians ask me, well, what do you think really happens when someone dies? <laughs> okay, okay. Well, do you think they kind of just kind of float around and, you know. No, I don't think that. And I don't think that because of what the Word says. The Word says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's the place. That's the place. Amen? Okay, so he says, I go and prepare a place. And then he says, and whether, uh, and whether I go ye know, and the way ye know. Oh, okay. So there's a place, and there's a way. Right? There's a place, and there's a way. <laughs> Jesus said unto him, now verse 6, I am the way. <laughs> I am what? The way, look at this, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Glory to God. Okay, again, you've heard this. If you've been in this church for any period of time, you've probably heard this before. I like to make it clear again. He didn't say a way. He said the way. Is that right? He didn't say a truth. He said, the truth. Well, Pastor, I, I, you know, I, I, I think you're just kind of narrow-minded when you talk like that. Every time you say that, I've heard you say it before, I think it's just kind of narrow. Hey, it is narrow. 
Exactly right. It's narrow. It's a narrow way of thinking. But somebody's got to teach you the narrow way to get through the narrow gate so you can get to the place. <laughs> you need to know how to get there. I need to know how to get there, right? So many people are unfamiliar with the narrow way. Even people that go and sit in church, that are churchgoers, that are even Christians, they've lost sight of the narrow way to the place. And let me tell you something, there isn't any devil in hell that is going to tell you and teach you the narrow way. There's plenty of devils and a lot of worldly people out there that are ready with the wide way. But the wide way leads to a wide gate which leads to destruction. Okay? <laughs> well, I just think, you know, you, you can have your opinion, but I just think there's many ways to God and there's many ways to heaven. Listen, you're entitled to that thinking, but just because you think that way doesn't make it true. Hallelujah. Well, glory to God. I'm already meddling and it's just the beginning of the new year. Praise God. Jesus said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's not a lot of ways. That's one way, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen? All right, go with me to John chapter 10, verse 7. John chapter 10, verse 7. Now, it is so important that, that what the way we think, what we think about God and what we think about the Word of God, we must have what we think. You've heard it before. We must have a foundation for what we believe. i got to have a foundation for what I believe. You have to have a foundation for what you believe. Amen? And the Word of God is the foundation for what we believe. It, it gives us what is true. And it shows us the way, because it's the truth, and it's the way to find the life. Amen. John chapter 10, verse 7, And Jesus said unto them again, Verily I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved." and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. He said, but I have come that they may have life, and life more abundantly. Amen? Listen to the Passion Translation. He says, so Jesus went over it again. I speak to you eternal truth. What kind of truth? Eternal. Because it's the truth. It's eternal it's not relevant to time. Well, I know that's the way they used to think, but that's kind of old-fashioned. And I kind of think it's this way, really. No. You're entitled to it, but again, it doesn't make it true. God's Word is eternal truth. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Is that right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made. The Word is the truth. That's the foundation, and it was in the beginning. So that's why it's so safe for you to base your life on what is true, because it's been around a really long time. Amen? It's dangerous to base your life on what you think or what you believe on something that's new. <laughs> like, well, it's just, you know, it's just kind of a new thing. It's kind of what they're doing now. It's just, uh, hey, be careful if that new doesn't agree with what has been established in the Word. You need to cast it out. Just throw it out. Amen. You can do that. You know, you don't have to hold on to everything you hear. Oh, that must be true. They have a microphone. It must be true. No. They have a lot of followers. It must be true. No, you're going to see that that's not true just because they have a lot of followers. All right, listen to Passion Translation real quick. So Jesus went over it again. I speak to you eternal truth. I am the gate for the flock. All those who broke in before me are thieves and who came to steal, but the sheep never listened to them. I am the gateway to enter through me is to experience life, freedom, and satisfaction. That sounds good. A thief 
has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. But I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness until you overflow. Amen. All right, let me switch gears. I got a lot of switching gears in this message, all right? It's all right. Things can seem right, but be wrong. Things can seem right, but be wrong. That's why you have to have the foundation of truth. And I'm going I'm to say this like this. There are people who have studied for a really long time. They may even be uh, professors in colleges and universities. And they can, they can paint a pretty appealing picture to things that seem right. But it's wrong. It leads to destruction. And it can seem right, but be wrong. It can seem very appealing and wrap itself up in peace, love, and harmony, <laughs> but it can lead to destruction. It's like the enemy has done a pretty crafty job of trying to take a lie and wrap it up with words that seem so appealing to people and put a little cute bow on it and tries to serve it to our young people. And then when they buy into it, they realize that they've based their life on something that is false and it's a lie. Glory to God, I'm preaching good, amen? Thank God for the Holy Ghost. And young people can follow the leading of the Spirit of God. And they can know and recognize what is right and what is wrong, regardless of their age. Because the Spirit of God can dwell in them just like He can dwell in you and I. Amen? So we should teach our children to listen to the Spirit of God. Our, what, what, we've set forth in our family is that we don't, our goal for our children has always been and will remain to send our children to the school, whatever school that may be, elementary, middle, high school, or college, that the Lord has for them to go to. Not just where there's opportunity, where the Lord has for them to go to. Because where the Lord has for them to go to, there will be opportunity. Compromise is what? the counterfeit to truth. So I don't want to send my kids to some college, some unbelieving college with some unbelieving professor that's going to tell them things against God and try to unravel what God has put in them. Now, I believe that God can protect them, God can lead them, and God can put them right in the middle of a university that's full of unbelievers, and they can be a light. I believe that, but God will direct your child to that school. Not every kid is up for that challenge. So I'm not saying not to go this career, not to go there, not to go there. Maybe that's exactly where you need to go. But the Spirit of the Lord will help you make those decisions. He'll help you make those decisions. He'll help your whole family, Amen. Now, this goes for the workplace. This goes for where you go to church. This goes for all kinds of things in our life. Amen? Amen. This isn't just for our kids. This is for us as adults, too. Amen? All right, go to Proverbs 14, 12. Proverbs 14, 12. All right. It says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Say, it seems right, but it's wrong. Okay, New Living says there's a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. Oh, a path. Say a path. There's a path. We, we already read about a place and a way. Well, the way is like the path. And this path, why this path, this path seems right, but it says it ends in death. <laughs> I told this story in first service. My father went home to be with the Lord in, in 2020, and before he passed away, he went out and bought a new car, 
And, you know, <laughs> I remember us siblings were like, does he really need a new car? He's over 80 years old. And then I said, you know what? It may be the last car he's going to buy. Let's let him buy it. Boy, was I wrong. He went out a few weeks later and bought another one. Okay, that's another story. But he gets his car, and he says, I want to go see my brother. His brother lives in northern Minnesota, north of Duluth, Minnesota. Okay, that's a little bit of drive. My dad's over eight years old, and I'm going, Dad, he's a dad, man, I, you know, I got to figure out how I can take some time off to get you up. He goes, time off? He goes, no, I'm going by myself. I'm going by yourself. I'm like, okay, let me get you a plane ticket. I'll get you, I'll get on. He goes, no, I'm not flying, I'm driving. Hey, wait a minute. You haven't driven to Minnesota in over 20 years, okay? And every phone I buy you disappears. You never use it. So we go out, we buy him. I think the third new phone I bought him over a period of years. Get it all set up, work it, try to show him how to use it, plug it in, charge it up. You know how long that phone lasts? As long as the first charge on the battery lasts from my dad. I'm like, Dad, there's got maps on here. You put the address in, I'm showing these things, right? He takes off, pew, Minnesota. Oh, by the way, he's going to drive around Atlanta because we used to live in Atlanta, outside of Atlanta. Saw, you know, visited different things, different landmarks, different things that we used to go to. Then he drives to Nebraska, goes, finds his childhood home that he grew up in. Then he drives, you know, oh, I went to Rochester, Minnesota, and then he drove up to find his brother, northern Minnesota. He gets back, a long time later, he gets back. Well, he doesn't tell us he's going to go on all these sightseeing things. He just says, I'm going to see my brother. So, okay, we're doing the math, calculating. Days go by, nobody hears from him, nobody knows what's going on. He's like, finally we've talked to him, he shows up. He's like, I'm fine, if I needed something, I'd figure out a way to get a hold of you. Yeah, but we don't know that you're fine, okay? But... Welcome to my world that I lived with my dad. Our attorney said, after my dad's passing, he says, you know, I meet very few men like your dad. He said, your dad was a man who knew what he knew, what he wanted, and that was it, and nothing was changing his mind. <laughs> he goes, nobody, what he believed is what he believed, and nobody was changing his mind on it. He goes, I like men like that. <laughs> Anyways, goes up there, drives all the way back. I go, dad, you didn't use the phone. I'm like, did you have a map? A map? No. I'm like, how did you get there? He goes, how did I get there? There's signs. <laughs> there was a place in northern Minnesota that he was going to get to. There was a way to get there. And there were signs to get him there. There's a place called eternity. There's a way to get there. And this book contains the signs to get you there. And the Lord revealed that to me. He said, man, you don't need to, you don't need to base it on this person and on that person and this person. I've showed you the way. I've given you the way. His name is Jesus. And he's in you. His spirit is alive in you. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. The same spirit. The same spirit. Listen to the Passion Translation. You can rationalize it all you want and justify the path of error you have chosen. But you'll find out in the end that you took the road to destruction. Whoo! Glory to God, that's good. I'm going to read it again. You can rationalize it all you want and justify the path of error you have chosen but you'll find out in the end that you took the road to destruction. And see, this is one of the arguments that people have. They're like, well, you know, if God is so good and God is loving, then why does he send people to hell? He doesn't send people to hell. You chose 
to go your way. You chose to live in error. You chose to live according to a lie. And you took the road of destruction. Amen. Glory to God. Not you, but you know. All right, go to Matthew 7. Say the gate. All right. There's a narrow gate, and there's a wide gate. Matthew 7, 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Woo! Broad. Wide is the gate. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. But, uh, excuse me, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Okay, that answered the question. Well, they have a lot of followers, and it's really compelling. Well, well, it said here, wide is the gate and broad is the way, and many there be which go thereat. This is the Passion Translation. It says, enter through the narrow gate, because the wide gate and broad path is the way that leadeth to destruction. Nearly everyone chooses that crowded road. Whew. The narrow gate and the difficult way leads to eternal life. So few ever find it. New Living Translation says, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. Jesus is the way. And he's the way through the narrow gate. Amen? All right, let's switch gears again. Go with me to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. Because I'm going to talk to you about the way we talked about the place and the way, but now we're going to talk about how to get there. Each day, you and I choose our meditation. I'll say it again. Each day, you and I choose our meditation. Meaning, if you don't purposely choose to meditate on the things of God, then your meditation will be provided for you, not free of charge, but by the world around you. Okay? Let me say it again. If you don't choose to meditate on the Word of God, then your meditation will be chosen for you by the world around you. Amen? Meditation changes what you believe. That's why I said, you don't want to go send your kids to somewhere that God doesn't have for them to go to and sit there and listen to some unbelieving non-God-fearing professor who talks about, you know, you know what they talk about, I don't need to tell you, you know, for hour after hour, and that thinking begins to get in them, and they begin to meditate on a lie. You meditate on a lie, you believe a lie. Meditation changes what you believe. Meditation rewrites your, in, your in, internal code. Let me say it again. Meditation rewrites your internal code. All right? Meditation changes how you process everything you see and hear. It changes the process in which you live and how you approach your natural physical senses, what you meditate on. For example, Jesus would go away alone and pray. He's praying, and he'd meditate, and he'd pray to the Father alone. Then he would come down amongst the people from the mountain oftentimes or wherever he was at, join the people, and if you'll notice, 
the consistency that Jesus was never moved by what it looked like in the natural. Because he was meditating and fellowshipping and praying with his heavenly Father. And that time of meditation and prayer with the Lord, his Father, prepared him to go into any area, any city, and no matter what devil, what sickness, what disease, it did not move him. He moved it. Glory to God. You seeing this? And you can look that up. I don't have time to do it today. In Matthew chapter 14, 23, if you're writing notes, Mark 6, 46, Luke 6, 12, and John 6, 15. All right, you're in Joshua. Look at this. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord is come to pass, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this, this people, unto the land which I give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given you, as I, was, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness of this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river of Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all, to the, all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it, from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate, say meditate, therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein. For then, so meditation, observing to do, then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid neither be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Woo! All right. He told Joshua to meditate on this book of the law. Is that right? That he may observe to do, and then he would make his way prosperous, and then he would have good success. If you're lacking prosperity and success, you need to take an inventory on what you're meditating on in anything in life. Amen? Meditation means to ponder it. Meditation means to think on it. Meditation can mean to read, to study, to confess it, to focus, to give your attention to, to prioritize, and to keep it, to meditate. In like soccer or even uh, hockey, the goalkeeper is called the keeper, right? They call him the goalkeeper, right? What is he doing? He's keeping the goal. He's supposed to be protecting the goal. Well, as we meditate on the Word of God, we keep or protect our own heart and our own mind. We're to guard our heart, the Bible says, with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life, right? So as we meditate on the Word, we are keeping the Word of God as a priority in our mind and in our thoughts and in our meditation. Amen? Now, Philippians 4.8 says that, you remember he says that, uh, Paul says, finally, my brethren, he says, whatsoever things are true, right? Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are uh, lovely, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are good report, he said, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, what did he say? Think on these things. That's a form of meditation. You're thinking on these things. You're meditating on what is pure, on what is lovely, on what is just, on what is a good report, on what is honest, thinking about those things. We have been bombarded for 24 months 
with more talk of sickness and death and disease than we probably ever have in our lifetime. Don't think that the enemy is not trying to get our focus on sickness and death to try to get you and I to meditate on something that is not the way, the truth, and the life. You hear a report, so be it. But then you need to get your mind off of that and put the Word of God in front of your eyes and in your ears so you can meditate that Jesus Christ is my healer. He is my healing. That by his stripes, I am healed. Praise God. And you meditate on the word. He sent his word to heal my disease. I thank you, Lord, that you satisfy me with long, healthy, prosperous life. I thank you, Lord, that I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. A thousand may fall at my side and ten thousand at my right hand, but it will not come near me, saith the Lord in Jesus' name. There are plenty of things, good things, in God's Word. See, that's the path. That's the path to the place. Sickness is not the path to the place. The Word of God and life is the path to the place. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And this is exactly how God was preparing Joshua to go take the promised land to go into Jericho, to take this land. You see, you and I were designed to believe. You were created to believe. Believing is not hard for you. Believing is in your spiritual DNA and spiritual nature of who you are. What the devil tries to get you to do is to believe a lie. To believe in the curse rather than believing in truth and life and healing and wholeness in Jesus. God created you and I to be free, to live free. He said that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Glory to God. Why? Because we're made in his image and after his likeness. Genesis 1, 26. Amen? You see, God has skillfully designed you and I in such a way that our spirit can bring about anything. Woo, okay, got quiet. Well, you know, now this preacher, I didn't know that's what this church was all about. All things are possible for him that believes. And don't you know that what you meditate on affects what you believe? If you don't know it, the devil knows it. And that's why I said you and I choose what we meditate on every day. And if you don't purposely choose to meditate on God's Word, your meditation will be chosen for you by the world around you. Meditation is designed to transform you into what you believe. And the devil knows this, I'm telling you. And he tries to keep you and I busy and preoccupied with all these things that are going on around us rather than taking the time to meditate on the promises of God. All the promises of God are what? Yes and amen. Worry is demonic meditation. I'm going to say it again. Worry is demonic meditation. Worry is designed to transform the way you think into believing a realm that only thing that is possible is limited to what is in the natural. That's what worry does. Worry doesn't see a way out. Worry gets lost in a room with no doors and no windows. You have a Savior. You have a Savior. His name is Jesus. And if you don't know him, I'll introduce you to him at the end of service. In fact, if you don't know him, you can get up right now and come down. I'll do it right now in the middle of service. I wouldn't even wait till the end. Amen? I mean, I, why, why wait for that? Just get up, walk down here while I'm preaching. I'll, I'll stop and pray with you. You can go back to your seat and we'll keep preaching. Yeah. 
Meditation resets your boundaries. When you meditate, well, it can reset your boundary either way. You ever notice somebody who hears something, they start meditating on it? Things that they were never afraid of. Now all of a sudden they're afraid of it. You're going, what, what are you talking about? You're not afraid of that. Well, yeah, I heard this report, and I've been doing a lot of study, and I've been doing a lot of research. Guess what? You meditate on the wrong thing, and it reset your boundary. We you meditate on God's Word, it pushes that boundary back. And it resets a new boundary, and this is the boundary. This is the boundary where all things are possible. That's how far it pushes the boundary. When you meditate on God's Word, it pushes the boundary to where all things are possible possible. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the devil doesn't want you to know this. The devil wants to keep the church this little cute little box. Oh yeah, you say, oh, you go to your little religious meeting. Oh, did you go to your religious meeting today? No, it's not a religious. I went to fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ is what I went to do. Talked to him, worshiped him, praised him, heard the word of God, heard the truth, heard the way, heard the life, because I'm going to a place. And I'm not going there busted, disgusted, and broken down on the way. I'm going there. I know it's narrow, but I got the way. Because there's signs. There are signs to show you the way. Hallelujah. Oh, glory, glory, glory. God's doing something in here, amen? You know, meditating on the Word of God moves a person from what they can do to what God and them can do. See, when a person starts getting caught up in worry, they're only thinking about the battle. But when you meditate on God's Word... See, that's what David was doing out there, tending to those sheep. He wasn't just watching sheep. He was, he was fellowshipping with the Lord. Because when he got and showed up on the battlefield, not, he wasn't skilled in battle, but he had been meditating on something. And when he was meditating, he was fellowshipping and worshipping the Lord. So when he showed up there on the battlefield just to, make, just to have delivery for his brothers, what he had been meditating on him moved the boundary. Moved the boundary. And you can hear it in his voice because he says, hey, I killed a lion, I killed a bear, and I'll do the same to you. See, the boundary had been moved. See, all things were possible to him. He didn't even have the new covenant. We have the new covenant. But see, it didn't matter. The promise is still the promise. God is still God. And what happens is people worry, they begin to meditate on the battle. He said, the battle's the Lord's. The victory's ours. I just sit there and figure out how to do it. I mean, he didn't say, he says, you come at, remember, yeah, I talked about that in the last week, you come at me with a sword and a shield and a spear. He didn't say, I come to you in this really handy dandy slingshot, I'm good. I'm like the slingshot champion. He didn't say that because his trust wasn't in that. Amen. And your trust can't be in your profession or in your skill or in your ability. But your trust can all be in the Lord. When your trust is in the Lord, glory to God. I tell you, that's where you're, you, you excel at everything you do when your trust is in the Lord. I don't care what you do if you're a doctor, a lawyer. I don't care. It doesn't matter. Engineer. Uh, I mean, I, here's what I believe. I believe there are so many inventions now, you, you can think what you want to think, but I believe there are so many witty ideas and inventions stored up in the church that God is waiting and trying to get people to meditate on his word so he can reveal and unleash them and release them and pour through the church these ideas to change the world around us. I think that we haven't seen anything yet Praise the Lord. Some people don't think like that. That's what I think. I think there's an unlimited source of creativity in the body of Christ. 
And I think the body of Christ, in some ways, has only been following the lead of the world. And I mean that in arts and entertainment. I mean that in engineering, in technology, in banking, in medical, all across the board, in education, in government. I think too much of the church has been following the lead of the world. And it's really time for a great shift to take place in the earth and for the world to begin to look at the church. So I believe. Yep. And I know that's some big talk, but that's what this church is about, in case you didn't know. I don't just try to keep, teach the cutest message that I can come up with. I just have to hear from the Lord and, and just deliver it as the Lord prepares my heart to minister on. We can't be followers. We can't be followers. We're not designed to be followers of the world. That's the wide path that so many are on. There is a narrow path and a narrow gate. Is it difficult at times? Yes, it is. But he fights the battle. We stand in faith. He, David said to Goliath, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a shield, and I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And that same name still holds the same power today as it did then. No matter what you're facing in life, there's still power in that name. And it's the name of Jesus Christ. Did you get something out of this? Stand to your feet, please. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Joe, would you get something out of that back there? All right, praise the Lord. Make it sure. Praise God, 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 praise God. You know, I've thought about that trip that my dad took to northern Minnesota many times since he took it. I've meditated on things about my dad. He's an interesting guy. Very quiet. Very quiet. Those of you who are here that knew him knew he was very quiet. A man of very few words. But a man that I can honestly say, I don't think he feared anything ever. I, can, I, I, can, I never, ever, ever can think of something that he feared. And he didn't worry. He didn't worry. Like, I can't tell you anything that my dad ever worried about. Ever. That's rare. Now think about that just as an example, just a small example. Getting in a car. I mean, I know teenagers that are super savvy with technology and maps and their phones and GPSs, and they would, might have a little anxiety about driving all the way to northern Minnesota from here. He gets in a car with no map, I had a phone, but he didn't use it, and drove all the way up there. Why? No worry, no care, no fear. Let that sink in a little bit this week and what you're thinking of. No care, no worry, no fear. You'd be surprised to the possibilities it opens up for you. Lord, we just thank you, Father, for this time with you. Thank you, Lord, that you poured into me and I poured out. You are so faithful, so merciful, so gracious. Your love knows no end. Lord, I pray that every person experiences your love. And that your love casts out all fear. And that this church is noted by being filled with the love of God in one mind, in one accord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, again, one more time. Don't leave here without knowing Jesus. I mean that, I mean that, I mean it. You need, 
Jesus in your life. If you haven't met him, you haven't been introduced to him, haven't prayed the prayer of salvation, you say, well, I've gone to church. Hey, you, you, you need to pray. Confess in your mouth, believe in your heart. All right? Don't just think, well, because I stand in the garage of my car, okay, just because you go to church doesn't mean you're Christian. You need to receive Jesus in your life. Amen? If you'd like prayer in any other area of your life, there'll be people up here at this altar to pray with you and to join their faith with your faith and believe God for a miracle in your life. We are a church that believes in miracles and we see them, okay? We see miracles. They happen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. Praise God for miracles. Praise God for miracles. Amen. Praise God for the supernatural power of God. Amen. Remember the way, the truth, the life. You are the head and not tail, above and not beneath, blessed going in, blessed going out. Everything you set your hand to, you're the lender, not the borrower. You're good looking, you're dismissed. God bless you.